Good morning. My name is Dr. Well, actually, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Charlene Brown, and many of you have seen me before. We're here to welcome Dr. Elizabeth Gaelic to the fifth in the Maryland Office of Preparedness's COVID-19 webinar series. And today we're talking about dementia symptom assessment and management under lockdown. So we're very excited to have Dr. Gaelic with us. Um, again, I'm Dr. Charlene Brown, and we want to just take a few minutes and thank our sponsors. So the Maryland Emergency Preparedness Network has been putting forth a series of COVID-19 webinars. There will be 15 between now and the end of the year. And the Office of Preparedness and Response is the sponsor of this, so thank you. Also, they are part of the larger Maryland Department of Health, to whom we are grateful. And the Maryland National Capital Home Care Association, which is Maryland and DC's trade association for home care agencies. We are thrilled that you've joined us today to hear this talk. I'm from Learn Care Together. And if you want more information, either about the Emergency Preparedness Network to join our mailing list, about MINCA, the Maryland National Capital Home Care Association, both websites you should be able to see on the screen and if you want to talk directly to Don Seek, she is the executive director of MINCA and oversees the Emergency Preparedness Network, you can just email her at dseek at minca.org. We have scheduled some of the November webinars coming up. We have Dr. Maduri Reddy, she's going to talk about how coronavirus has forever changed home care. Dr. Reddy is a geriatrician and the co-founder of the Care Academy, which is an online caregiver education platform that has been working with home care agencies for years. And Dr. Alan Abrams is also a geriatrician who will be talking to us on later in November on topics that are still under development. So be sure to email us with your ideas and topics that you're interested in hearing about this fall. We will have more webinars in September and October. And as soon as we have them scheduled, you'll be notified because if you're at this webinar, you are now also officially on the mailing list for the Emergency Preparedness Network. So Dr. Gaelic is a professor at the University of Maryland School of Nursing. She is a brilliant PhD nurse practitioner who specializes in improving neuropsychiatric care practices for older adults and their family caregivers. So she is a researcher. She is a practitioner. She has a house call practice for dementia symptom management, and in this role has come up with a lot of creative solutions to managing and assessing dementia in the home during the pandemic. She is the past president of the Gerontologic Advanced Practice Nurses Association, a scientific review member for the National Institute of Aging, and more and more and more. She's even co-editor in chief of caring for the ages and an expert advisor for CMS. So let us take this moment and before we actually have Dr. Gillett start her talk, we're going to, we're actually going to run a poll. So Nelson, if you could put the poll up. This will help Dr. Gillick as she does her talk. She wants to understand if you've had any COVID-19 related challenges while trying to do home visits and what creative avenues you've taken to maintain contacts with your clients and patients during the pandemic. So we'll just, take you know 30 to 45 seconds for you to fill out the poll and then let's find out what the answers are we should have like some poll music yeah to play like during. like like jeopardy or something exactly <laughs> the jeopardy song was just going through my head actually yeah so, but I will spare you uh, along. So, <laughs> okay, if you haven't filled out the poll, you are out of time. Let us find out the results. Okay, so 44% of you, the patient refused. Aha, clinician refused, building staff. Whoa, building staff refused to allow entry is the number one challenge that people have had trying to do home visits. And then what creative steps, telephone calls, yes. You know, the, old, the oldest technology is sometimes the best technology. Um, telephone calls and telehealth seem to be the winners here with emails being close behind. So um, with no further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Gaelic for her to do her talk. 
welcome. Thank you, Charlene, so much. And I'm just gonna share my screen. Please do. There we go. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. I am so thrilled to be here with you today and to talk about um, a population that's very near and dear to my heart, uh, older adults with dementia and their caregivers, be it their family caregivers or if it is uh, professional caregivers in assisted living facilities, small group, group homes, et cetera. So at the end of the session, uh, I'm hoping you're gonna walk away uh, with some creative strategies to assess and manage symptoms that we're seeing um, in older adults with dementia who are receiving or trying to receive home care during the COVID-19 era. We're also going to discuss some innovative um, interventions that you can use to enhance communication, safely conduct um, some uh, in-person visits, and maintain physical function uh, for your clients because many of them um, really have been limiting their ability to move around and we're seeing a lot of decline. So as I'm sure you're all well aware, uh, the COVID-19 has had a tremendous impact upon uh, persons living with dementia and their caregivers. And you see a lot in the popular press in terms of the impact of the social isolation and how uh, that limited interaction with other people has kind of cascaded and resulted in a lot of other uh, concerns and issues. And this list is certainly not exhaustive, but some other uh, things that we've seen is that um, people with dementia have had uh, more rapid cognitive decline. Sometimes that's from a, a delirium, either a reaction to a medication or um, perhaps a um, illness that's not identified um, that's resulting in the cognitive decline, or it could be just because of the lack of stimulation and interaction and meaningful activity is um, speeding things up a bit in terms of their dementia. I would tell you that early on in the pandemic, um, I actually received very few calls about behavioral symptoms of distress or some of the neuropsychiatric symptoms. For about the first two months, people were kind of okay to be hunkered down and I wasn't hearing a whole lot of things. And then after that, um, now I'm hearing a lot more, getting a lot more referrals um, as people are, are you know, prolonged, uh, having a lot prolonged time spending time in their homes and we're seeing more issues um, you know, with um, the interactions with caregivers that are challenging and, and the patients. We've also seen a profound lack of physical activity. And this has really resulted in increased functional disability in a population with dementia. And so we're gonna, I'm gonna share some strategies with you of um, things you can share with your clients and have them do. Also, we've seen a lot of postponed medical care um, and then some of the sequela that results from that. Uh, and then lastly, uh, caregiver stress. And I'm sure many of you have um, experienced this um, as well. Caregivers are really feeling isolated. Uh, I imagine many of your referrals are coming following a hospitalization um, because I think people are, are caregivers are not choosing um, a post-acute setting as much because of concerns of COVID um, for their family members and they're going directly home and they're probably sicker um, than we're used to seeing and um, because the families have not been able to be part of that hospitalization and be advocates because of COVID restrictions, um, you're often the first person they're seeing. And you know, I, I think we're getting to deal with a lot of caregiver stress. So um, these are some lessons that I've learned in, um, during the time in COVID in doing uh, both house calls to people's homes, as well as um, visits to um, assisted living facilities um, and, and how we can kind of uh, be creative and work around uh, COVID. So obviously it sounds like from the poll, you all are calling first. And for some of you, that's really how these visits are going down. The telephone is, is really our friend. Um, and calling first allows us to kind of at least get a lay of the land, consider what's possible 
and try to really prioritize um, the patient needs and goals of care. When I do an introductory phone call or if I'm doing a follow-up with a patient who's known to me, I'm specifically asking about changes that we see in the patient's cognition, function, and behavior um, during COVID. Um, I want to find out, have there been any recent hospitalizations? Hospital records have been extraordinarily difficult to get a hold of during this time. Um, and it's result in, in fragmented care where the home care team is not always receiving um, the information from the hospital aside from a, a more basic uh, discharge instruction sheet that may be coming um, uh, to the family. And so we're, we're having to dig and try to find out more of the details to try to prevent a readmission. Um, additionally, um, you want to get a sense about um, risk. Um, so if you were to go into the home, if the family or if the patient allowed you there or if the facility allowed you in, you want to know about the, the COVID status of the people who live there, um, if that's even been done or known. If it's a facility, um, many states are, are tracking this and it's publicly available, so that's a way you can check. But for people who are in their own homes, you want to find out about their physical contact with others, the extent of their isolation, and how many people are living in the home, and what are those other individuals doing? Because that's going to help you prepare in terms of um, what you may do uh, in terms of planning the visit. As I mentioned before, really trying to get down to the nitty gritty, what does the patient and family really see as their primary need, and then what are the um, overarching goals of care? Do they have an advanced directive? Um, you know, what is their knowledge of that and how, how has that been discussed? And then, I, I, you know, I know we're all doing symptom screens and then it's also a good idea to have an, uh, have an understanding of what the, the patient and if they're able to share that, but more often the family or caregivers, what's the understanding of the COVID-19 risk? And would the patient and family be, will they wear PPE? Um, if you are going to the site or would they need that as a resource. So there's different types of visits um, that you can conduct and I will tell you that I've done all of these um, in the past um, four months. And we'll talk briefly about telehealth, um, what has become kind of my favorite go-to, which is the outside doorway window visit, particularly when um, families or facilities have concerns about um, me coming inside, which we can totally appreciate um, because I'm, you know, even if I can show them a, a, a COVID testing, it's only as good as the last time you've had it. Um, and then in some instances, you are doing inside visits with physical distancing um, for the majority of the visit. And then we'll talk also about inside with physical contact. And so you're balancing what the patient's needs are and seeing um, the most, the limited amount of contact that you can get by with to actually meet the patient's needs. And you wanna consider the pros and cons of different visit formats. So first, in terms of telehealth, it's really the best in terms of decreasing risk of exposure to COVID-19. The other thing that's great about it is you're able to include family who may not live with the patient, um, you know, if they're tech savvy and can do this. Many instances, it's confusing for um, our patients who have cognitive impairment to look at a screen and see someone. Um, it really depends on the patient. And you know, so it may make things a little more difficult with your assessment and communication. You also really need a caregiver or someone who has some technological savvy or within your office or within your home care office if there's a way to provide client support for telehealth. Um, but I will tell you um, based I've, I've done very little telehealth, I've done some, um, but um, I find that um, uh, from some colleagues who've done a lot more of it, that they're missing pertinent exam findings when they occur from the waist down. And I will give you an example. Um, I recently got a call about a patient that I had been following with late stage dementia, lived in a small group home, and he had been doing well for some time. Um, to make a long story short, he was not sleeping well at night, he was agitated, he was taking off his shoes and throwing them, um, and he, he had pretty significant communication difficulties and wouldn't, couldn't really tell us what was wrong. And um, 
then, you know, both shoes are coming off, the socks are coming off, he's throwing it in the evening. And um, the request was for uh, an increased dose in his, um, one of his psychiatric medicines. Ultimately, by doing the um, outside visit, which we're gonna talk about, the doorway visit, which we're gonna talk about um, in a minute, I was able to um, assess his feet and actually see that he had um, a significant, he was diabetic and he had a significant infection in his toe. And so his behavior of taking off his shoes and throwing them was really a result of pain. And that was something that got missed earlier on um, a telehealth visit with his primary care provider. So telehealth is great, but we just have to be aware about what some of the limits are. So I'm a big fan of the outside visits and, and I kind of refer to these as outside, doorway, window. I've, I've done a lot of different uh, adaptations to this. It does help to decrease the risk of uh, exposure to COVID um, for both parties. And it's really great for things that um, you do in terms of visits that require observation. So you're able to do an assessment of mental status, of gait, a uh, musculoskeletal exam, especially if you have a caregiver there that you can direct and get them to do some things for you. You can do some aspects of a neuro exam. You can assess skin integrity and look for edema and caregivers, as I said, can help. The distancing required with these visits, because we try to maintain a six foot distance, can sometimes make communication more challenging, for, particularly for people who have hearing impairment. But I'm gonna show you some tricks of the trade that um, I've been using to, to be helpful for that, um, um, to, to make communication a little bit easier. These visits, unfortunately, are not very helpful when you need to do palpation or auscultation. And so there are limits to them. And these are some pictures of um, myself and another provider doing some um, uh, visits um, at a, a window. And um, they would crack the screen a bit to help with hearing. There's another picture at a, a this was um, at a facility, a small assisted living facility that um, had about a dozen residents and they set up a uh, a little uh, tent in the backyard and had chairs. Uh, they would have chairs on both sides with a plastic sheet in front of it. Um, and this was kind of, uh, you know, at the height of, of the infection and how we were able to do uh, some visits and get some eyes on the patients. So enhancing communication. Um, when I do a, a, a drive-by or outside visit, I always call, uh, whether it's the family or if it's at a facility, I call and get the history by phone. I do med reconciliation by phone, or I have them uh, you know, be able to slide me copies of the med sheets when I arrive if, if that's too difficult. So I get history by phone, and then I do my exam by visit. And um, here's a photo of, um, we use for a gentleman who had some significant hearing impairment and the distance made it hard. We used what's called a pocket talker. Um, they run, their prices vary. They run probably about $200. Sometimes you can find cheaper ones. Walkie talkies we've used as well. Um, you know, you have to make sure that you're cleaning the other walkie talkie. The pocket talkers are nice because um, it doesn't require me to touch anything. Uh, and uh, this was a way that the, the patient would put the headset on, the caregiver inside could prop up the pocket talker, and I could speak into the microphone and the patient would be able to hear me. Um, and I could do a comprehensive mental status exam that way to find out how he was doing. So sometimes um, we do need to do traditional visits. The families want us in there and, you know, um, risk may be uh, lower as long as we have our uh, PPE on, and sometimes these are necessary to meet the, the client's needs. The advantage also is to you're able to assess the environment, the home environment, as well as to do a, a more comprehensive exam of the patient. I will tell you when I do, when I do go into someone's home, I try to maintain distancing. I wear my PPE, and if I need to do anything that's hands-on, I try to do it quickly, 
um, uh, and you know, limit it. And I uh, probably should take stock in hand sanitizer with the amount of hand sanitizer I've been using, and you know, I've, after my gloves come off and things like that. Um, challenges uh, re are related often to PPE. It makes communication a little difficult, particularly for someone with cognitive impairment, and it uh, may result in patient fear. So I had a patient who kind of didn't understand um, who all these masked, you know, who the masked people were that were coming in. And I've never had this happen to me, but others have mentioned that they've uh, dealt with families who would refuse to wear PPE. Um, and this, obviously, the, the traditional visits are the uh, greatest risk of COVID-19 exposure. So um, some, that's a little bit about the visits. Now we're going to talk about what you might find when you're visiting, or, or what at least I'm seeing a lot of and some of my colleagues are as well. Some common challenges during COVID-19 for these home care patients with dementia. So I mentioned before the cognitive decline, the functional decline, we're seeing increasingly more behavioral symptoms of distress as well as caregiver stress. So I'm trying to give you some um, information to help you with your assessment of cognitive decline and what I would always recommend if you're gonna do this to try to track things during COVID for your longstanding clients is to use a standardized instrument. Does it, I, I have no preference to what you use. I have some links on the next slide and we'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages of each of the screening instruments. But it's important to try to stick with the same one so that you can track changes over time. You also wanna assess on your phone call, has there, you know, has there been a significant change in social or cognitive stimulation? So for people who may be living in facilities, are they still in room lockdown? Are they allowing doorway uh, interactions? Um, are they allowing people in the dining room yet? Are visitors allowed to be outside? Um, you know, so what is happening in terms of uh, stimulation? And then have these cognitive changes, and this is kind of particularly more for the folks at home, resulted in new safety risks. So if they're declining, is that individual still able to take their medications? Are they willing to take their medications? Are there issues related to wandering that didn't exist before? Um, or challenges with ensuring adequate nutrition and hydration? And then lastly, um, you know, in addition to the deconditioning, if there's been deterioration in visual spatial skills from progressed cognitive impairment, is there an increased risk of falls and what can we do in the home to try to help with that? Um, the other thing in terms of home assessment, if you can't see patients, you know, if they're able to take the, their camera around to show you elements of the home, that's great. If they're willing to take pictures, some of them are not. Um, but if they're willing to do that, to, to share with you, um, you know, like kind of setups, how the bathroom might be set up or how they're um, organizing meds, these are things that they can even show you over telehealth if they're willing. So I've listed some of the most common cognitive screening instruments available. Uh, the St. Louis University Mental Status Exam and the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, um, um, affectionately called the MOCA, and the, the other one for St. Louis is affectionately called the SLUMS. Um, they're both great instruments for people who, um, it helps us to detect even mild impairment in someone. Um, so they're really good at picking up subtle changes that things like the mini cog or the mini mental status exam may not be able to identify. For people who are more um, progressed that we know have dementia and are, are more severely affected, um, then these instruments may not be ideal and may be frustrating to patients um, because they may not be able to answer many of them. There's uh, the mini mental status exam that many of you are aware of. It's now proprietary. So um, even though it's available out there, I'm not allowed or permitted to share a link with you, um, but um, you can access that. One of the challenges with the mini mental is that it has what we call a ceiling or floor effect, and um, which makes um, uh, it hard to detect people who have mild impairment and it doesn't track things really well in terms of severe impairment. And then last is the mini cog. The advantage of the mini cog is it's really quick. Um, it only takes about three minutes to administer. Um, and so if you're pressed for time or if you have someone who's not real cooperative, this is often helpful. 
So three kind of uh, pearls, clinical pearls in terms of managing cognitive decline during COVID. Um, right now, we need to always assume that any cognitive decline that we see may be what we call a subsyndrome or, or a mild delirium until proven otherwise. So you're looking at medications as possible culprits um, and you wanna consider deprescribing and some of the, um, you know, you'd be working with um, the, the prescribing team, whoever that um, may be, to look at psychotropic medications, in particular narcotics, and then anticholinergic medicines, um, things like diphenhydramine, Benadryl, some of the medicines for bladder, um, because um, for urinary incontinence, because these can actually uh, precipitate cognitive decline. You also want to try to work with the client and family to match appropriate sensory stimulation activities for the level of cognitive impairment. So um, you don't wanna to try to give them something that's stimulating that's too difficult or too confusing for them, but trying to match that appropriately and something that might be meaningful uh, to the patient. So whether that's music or looking at old photos, spending some time outside just for a change of scenery, simple puzzles or tactile activities. And then the last thing is emphasizing with families the importance of trying to maintain um, a regular routine for their individuals with cognitive impairment. Um, now we're going to talk a bit about physical activity. There's a lot of different ways we can assess physical activity and ideally if we can do that with a standardized instrument or a sensory based technology, that's all the better because we'll have more information about what they're actually doing. I've included um, uh, a survey, that's the Yale Physical Activity Survey that gives you, will estimate how much time people are spending in different um, activities during the day. There's also um, accelerometers, so this is like the Fitbit and the Smart Apple Watch and they have um, you know, more inexpensive ones. There's also the good old fashioned pedometers if you have patients who are walking. Um, even if they just wear it for a day, it may help to uh, tell you how much they're moving around or often how very little they're moving around. And then the last thing is kind of a, a fun uh, assessment, um, is particularly during COVID, because I'm sure we've seen this really shrink. It's called the Life Space Questionnaire, and it gives you a sense of how much people are moving and what is their, um, you know, are they going outside? Are they going to different rooms in the house? Are they spending all their time in one room? So these are things that are all freely available and um, you can use um, to do your assessment. So next, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, assessment of underlying physical capability. So in other words, based on what someone can do based on their strength, their range of motion, their balance, and their cognitive function, what can they actually do? So if a person can raise their hands, they have good upper body strength, they can hold something, they, you may be able to encourage the family to have that person wash their upper body, comb their hair, brush their teeth. Um, and if you want information about the physical capability scale, it's published. I put um, a link to ResearchGate where the full article with the scale is available and instructions. And also there's on the Function Focus Care website, which again is a free website, there's instructions and uh, examples of how to use the instrument. Um, and then um, some other uh, scales that are, have been around for a long time and again are freely available. The Barthel Index looks at um, activities of daily living and then the Lawton Instrumental Act of Activities of Daily Living scale looks at obviously IADLs. And so um, here are some photos of some creative ways of getting people to um, engage in function and physical activity. You know, there is a Christmas tree in that one picture, um, but I'm still a big fan of the pool noodles. So while this was not happening during COVID, um, in, in some other projects that we've done, we've gotten pool noodles, we've cut them in half, and they're great for a range of motion and good for people who might be frail, where lifting weights might be challenging. Also, if people who have dementia, who have behavioral uh, symptoms and may use things to strike one another with, the pool noodle's not gonna hurt anybody. They're also, you can um, sanitize them with bleach, um, they might lose their color a little bit, but, um, or you can, they're cheap enough that you can keep them in uh, people's rooms. 
And later, I think I'll share, there's a, an exercise sheet of things you can do with pool noodles. I'll send that to Charlene so she can send that out with you. The other picture is a woman that I saw recently um, during a time of COVID. She was an avid cyclist before she had um, a, a stroke. Um, and uh, again, to make a long story short, she's been in a small assisted living facility and, you know, has really only, um, you know, has been in lockdown for several months. We were able to get her a small uh, floor pedal machine and um, she was so happy with it when we actually gave it to her, she got teary um, and wanted to immediately put her shoes on. Uh, push those uh, um, foot pedals from her wheelchair back and get at it. Um, I, I fa also found out that her caregiver, a young uh, gentleman who's, who's quite wonderful, um, one of the staff members there, puts, um, pulls up on his computer GoPro videos of people have taken during their cycling trips so that she can look at that and it feels like she's actually moving and cycling. So that's another avenue that you can take. And these are just some other examples, really trying to get people to move and to integrate things into familiar activities. So we have somebody with a little hand sweeper, even though the floor didn't need any sweeping, that's okay. That it's a meaningful activity. She feels like she's doing something and it's getting her to move around. Um, shaving doesn't always have to be in the bathroom. People sometimes get, um, uh, with dementia, especially if it's severe, have challenges um, with uh, uh, small spaces. And so spreading it out and having it in a kitchen can work better. And getting people outside and the one picture of one of our, our wonderful caregivers um, working and taking out the trash with somebody who really needed to burn off a lot of energy. <laughs> she, she was quite physically fit. And so anything they could get um, for her to help was, was a great activity. Here's um, some more pictures and a little uh, funny cartoon. Um, I'm a big proponent, particularly of older adults who are frail, of working with them in terms of sit to stand exercises um, because it's been shown to help prevent falls and again, help to keep people out of Hoyer lifts and keeps caregivers from hurting their backs. You can do these. Um, the top picture is someone who's on a, a, a toilet. So you can have them simply do a sit to stand exercise after they're um, on the toilet. Um, you can also incorporate it into a game. So the other lady you can see has some uh, foam horseshoes in her hands. And rather than saying, we're going to do some exercise, I want you to stand. I'll just say, you know, here, take, take, a, take a try at this game. And you can get people, um, especially if they want to try to do it while they're sitting down, their aim usually is not as good. So I just say, you know what? You'd be a little better if you'd stand up. And getting them to stand, they're, they're easily engaged in doing those type of activities. Some tips in terms of motivation um, to get people to engage in physical activity, particularly our clients with dementia, try to make it fun. Um, and make, you can have them engage in familiar activities, sometimes seeing other people do things. So if you can get the caregiver to demonstrate things for them, it helps to have role models. Um, we talked about incorporating that activity into daily routine. Music is a great motivator for particularly for people with um, more severe dementia because that part of our brain that processes music is one of the last areas to be affected. And then we want to try to manage or decrease any unpleasant sensations. So it may be fear of falls or anxiety or pain. Um, the other thing that's helpful, again, this is a, um, some socially distanced walking um, in, a, in a small uh, senior group home. Um, and uh, just sometimes just that change of pace. I had another picture you can see in the one where there's the... Uh, the table for rest period, you know, for rest period should they need it, but getting outside uh, when the weather's reasonable um, so they can get a bit of fresh air. This is just a screenshot of a website that um, I created with some co uh, other colleagues um, that talks about ways to um, optimize function and physical activity with older adults. There's a bunch of different sections to it. In the video coaching area, we have several short kind of three minute YouTube videos, um, about half of them on the top level, you can see I'm looking a little younger there, um, were, are <laughs> um, focused more on motivating to engage in physical activity, 
while the bottom seven of them focus more on individuals with cognitive impairment who may also have some co-occurring behavioral symptoms and how you manage um, that as well. Uh, now, I could do a whole talk on assessing and managing behavioral symptoms of distress and dementia, um, but I, and we don't have time for that today, but I wanted to at least give you some resources since this is something that I think we're seeing more um, in facilities. And I, I'm a big fan of an approach called the DICE approach, and it's just an acronym um, for what we have before us. Um, describing the behavior, investigating the impact of uh, different things, creating a plan, and then evaluating the effectiveness. I put a link to an article that explains it. If you, um, they will give you instructions. There's also um, things that are available on the web. Some of them charge, some of them don't. Um, but just to run through quickly, one of the most important things, because you may be getting calls from caregivers um, in the home or also from uh, caregivers in, in facilities, reporting behavioral symptoms, and rather than ju them just saying the person's agitated or up at night, really emphasize to get that good description of what's happening in terms of the behavior. When is it happening? How frequently has it been happening? What's changed um, for the person? Um, are there any things that seem to trigger it? And then you wanna go with, through with that caregiver and think about some of the different triggers. Could it be that that person is medically sick? So that gentleman before who I told you about who was throwing his shoe and it appeared like a psychiatric symptom actually wound up to be a, a you know an infection in his toe. Um, think about the environment. Is it overstimulating or understimulating? Um, is how is the caregiver approach? I had a gentleman who had just been discharged from the hospital, and um, the family was really nervous about having him get out of bed, um, even though he had walked into the hospital following his discharge. They were nervous, so when he was feeling well enough, he was trying to get out of bed, and he could. He had the strength to, but everybody was constantly telling him, "No, no, no, no! You have to stay in bed," and um, it resulted in a, a pretty significant outburst. Um, and he also has, you know, fortunately we caught things early, he, uh, but um, there was the risk of some skin breakdown with him spending um, several days in bed. So, and then you wanna consider the extent of the individual's cognitive impairment when developing your plan. Some tips for managing behavioral symptoms. Some I got a little ahead of myself and many of these I went over um, already, uh, trying to explore triggers. For people who have more severe dementia, sometimes we talk too much, we talk too quickly, or we touch them too much and do things for them. So always trying to get the person to do what they can for themselves and trying to communicate in a way that's not overwhelming for the person. Those are helpful things. We talked about role modeling the, the, the desired behavior. If you try something once and they won't do it, at, you know, Often, many of us are not going anywhere, so having the caregiver come back and reapproach at another time is helpful. Um, when individuals are expressing symptoms of distress, it's important that before we try to redirect them from it, we all want to be heard. So if we've had a bad day, um, you know, we come home, we want to share that with our, our, our family members or our friends or our loved ones, and we don't want them to tell us what we should or shouldn't do, or, you know, it's time to move on and let's go take a walk. We want them to listen to us and to empathize uh, with the frustration that we've uh, been experiencing. And in general, we want to be cautious in terms of starting new psychiatric medicines at this time. It doesn't mean that you can't, but a medicine is not always the solution given some of the examples that I was sharing with you before. These are some um, uh, resources that you can access. Uh, I mentioned the function focused care one. There's also these great training videos from UCLA that are designed for family caregivers when dealing with different behavioral symptoms showing a less desired approach as well as a, a more positive approach. And then the nursing home toolkit is kind of stock full of um, strategies and non-pharmacologic um, interventions in terms of promoting positive behavioral health. And while it's designed for nursing home, it can be applicable really um, to multiple settings. And then lastly, I just wanna briefly consider and acknowledge um, the stress that many of our caregivers are under. 
So they're dealing with a lot of fear with the pandemic. They're uh, having prolonged isolation and maybe there some of their sources of respite are, are no longer there. Um, whether it's going out and having breaks and other family members coming in or, um, you know, some staff members in some of these small places have um, opted to receive extra pay and have live-in times in the facility. So we, we want to acknowledge the stress that they're under. And if you wind up having a face-to-face -face contact or even a phone contact with them, um, you may get a lot of negative emotion and often it's because you might be the first person that they've had that with. And so they, they may not really be coming after you as much as kind of just venting their frustration and, and, um, uh, with you know, everything that's been going on. Um, also that lack of visiting and family advocacy during hospitalization. Uh, due to the COVID-19 restrictions can sometime, again, lead to that displaced anger following discharge uh, because they have not been involved in the, in the hospitalization. And so really what I'm doing with families is helping them to try and caregivers to set short-term goals and try to help them achieve um, their long-term ones. So making little baby steps. There's a great book out there. Uh, I get no money for it. I didn't write it. It's a lady named Jolene Brackey, but it's wonderful um, in terms of giving families ideas about how to communicate with their loved one with dementia and how to be in the moment. It's called Creating Moments of Joy, and it's something that um, I've gotten a lot of positive feedback from families on. And that, I think, brings us to our time for questions. Thank you, Dr. Gaelic. I wish we had like a, a you know, a track where there's clapping. Um, that was an excellent talk. And people in the chat agree. I've, we've gotten questions that say, will there be an option to listen again? This was excellent. And Good. so Wonderful. goes to you. Um, well done. I learned a lot just listening to you. And let's transition to questions. Sure. So let's see. We, well, we have more. Excellent. Very good info. Thank you. Um, so does anyone have any um, questions for Dr. Gaelic? I would love this recording for my siblings. <laughs> <laughs> um, any, any clarifying points or things you'd like Dr. Gaelic to answer? Any situations that you have faced that you love her opinion on? Ah, okay, please send the links to the assessment and resources in an email. Okay, we'll do. Ah, here's a question from Laura's. Um, we can, we can, um, I, I have actually, I have some ideas. It says any great ideas on how to communicate more effectively with a mask on. Great. So, so I, I will tell you kind of, um, you know, where I've been with this. Um, I, I use, um, a mask that covers, you know, a, covers my mouth. I don't use an N95 mask unless I know someone has COVID. Um, I'll just use, you know, a regular surgical mask. Um, but uh, the pocket talker thing and the walkie talkies, if you have a caregiver, that, that sometimes can help with the hearing. The issue a lot of times is, is particularly for people who may be used to reading lips or seeing faces, if they can see your mouth, they do make, um, clear now they're they're out on the market um, clear face masks I, I wouldn't use them for up close interactions but if you're at six feet it may be an option to consider if that's a real obstacle um, the other thing that's sometimes helpful if you have to have a lot of gear on um, is to um, and they can't see your face is to have a picture a rather large one um, not the little tiny tags that we often wear, but um, that shows us kind of smiling uh, it, and wearing that in front of us. Um, I, I've seen that uh, done and that be helpful. Um, so those are some ideas in terms of communication. It's also why I get the history on the telephone before I go, um, because that limits the amount of time I have to, one, expose myself and expose the, the, the patient. Um, and, and it makes communication a little bit easier. And then I think the next question, I hope that answered. Um, the next question is, did you involve PTs and OTs and exercise related activities for patients? 
uh, related to safety and litigation protection. So, um, you know, these are people who are uh, many times living in their own homes. If they're coming out of the hospital, a lot of times they will have PT and OT involved. But um, if you're doing, if you, you do that capability assessment and you're matching uh, what their underlying capability is with what the task is, you should be fine. You, you know, you're gonna have to be careful in terms of your documentation. Uh, unfortunately, I've seen, I, I also do some work in long-term care and what I've seen unfortunately over the past decade or so is that people are, who may be walking into assisted livings and nursing homes are getting put in wheelchairs and told not to walk, and not to do anything to themselves until they have a PT or OT assessment. And, and I worry that nursing, and I, I, I work collaboratively with my PT and OT colleagues, so it's not that I disregard their assessment, but what I am worried about is what happened to that gentleman who was discharged from the hospital, who spent a week in bed before his home care could start and develop, you know, when he could ambulate and wound up, um, you know, partially impacted. I didn't even get into that. And as well as um, having some skin breakdown in these behavioral things because he wasn't permitted to get out of bed. So I think we need to balance um, things uh, in terms of what we're asking people to do. But if you're assessing someone's underlying capability, so for example, if you assess someone and they're unsteady standing up, you're not gonna wanna give them, uh, and you're worried about the caregiver being able to help them, you don't wanna give them a, uh, a sweeper and have them sweep. You may wanna have them do a, a, a bike pedal on the floor. Um, or you may want to have them do um, their exercises, their upper body exercises. Um, so you're, you're trying to match what, they, what their capability is with the activities you're recommending. And I've, I've been practicing a long time. I've never had issues related to litigation related to this. Uh, any suggestion on how to handle the patient who does not respond well because you have a mask on and the mask causes increased behavior? Yeah, that, that is a challenge. Um, in general, I've not, that's been an infrequent type of thing, but it has happened. Um, and in those cases, uh, like I said before, I try to have a photo of myself so that they can see what my face looks like. Um, and, you know, I, I, again, could use that clear mask that you can purchase um, online, they're making them, they're not as good in terms of safety for you, but if you maintain a six foot distance, um, that, may, that may be helpful. Um, and, you know, trying to get eye contact, even though people can't see you smile, they can kind of uh, oftentimes sense uh, the emotion from, um, from your eyes, but it, it is a challenge. And we are gonna be sending all the links and resources out to you. Are there any other questions that I'm missing? Yes, there are actually a couple in the chat. So oh. I'll give them out to you. Oh, okay. Um, so one is, can you address issues with individuals within the home without a caregiver? How best to help them, especially when they don't seem to understand? Oh. So, <laughs> Um, and I guess I'm not sure what they're not understanding, but um, if, if someone's at home and they're alone, that's where you, and you're sensing that they're not understanding any directions that you're giving to them, then you really need to consider whether or not they're still safe to remain in the home. And so that would be uh, where I would use one of those cognitive screening tests. Um, instruments and uh, do some assessment of their cognition. I'd also want to try to do as much of a physical exam as I can and then collaborate with um, whoever their uh, provider is to try to figure out if this is something that's identified or is, is it a recent change. Also, if you can go with concrete examples to the provider um, of uh, home safety concerns, um, rather than just saying, you know, I'm really confused concern that they're confused and they don't understand, being very specific and saying things like, I went over medications with this client and the, the patient couldn't show me, demonstrate how he has been taking his medicines. 
you know, there's no system in place. I did, you know, a pill count or, you know, I looked in the bottles and they were all still filled. Um, so the more concrete and specific things you can, you can gather is, is helpful. That's also someone that if they would be willing to wear one of those um, physical activity monitors might be helpful because at least you'd know how much they're moving around and what time of day they're moving around. Um, if that's something that's financially feasible. Okay, that's a great answer. The next question is, do you have any ideas on how to help families whose loved ones are having trouble with sleeping? Yes, so um, a couple of things. Um, if the sleep, older adults, you know, so as we age, we spend less time in mm -hmm. our deeper stages of sleep, sleep uh, stages three and four, and it's more, it, we're more easily aroused. So there's a number of non-pharmacologic things you can do to try to promote better sleep. One is um, not doing screen time right before bed, uh, not sleeping with the television on, which I know a lot of people do. Um, instead, maybe a radio or some white noise machines or some music in the background is often a better choice. Having, um, uh, trying to go to bed and get up at the same time every day as much as feasible. And then what I've seen predominantly during the pandemic is people are having difficulty sleeping because they're not doing anything during the day. And, and I, I have to say that um, I even had that problem as well um, and, uh, until recently. And so trying to work with them to try to get them, even if they're staying in their home, to be more physically active through some of the uh, creative ways that uh, we've shared. Uh, there's also, if you go to the National Institute of Aging website, there's a wonderful, and I'll, I'll send it so that you guys have it when we send out the resources, I'll add this in there. Um, for people who are a little more intact, there's a wonderful online resource as well as if they request it, they'll mail them a copy of these great exercises and they show examples of how you can do them um, either in a chair or not in a chair. Um, and so getting them involved in doing some resistive exercises, maybe even doing a little dancing and you're, you know, you're emphasizing that you're trying to get them to move more so that their body is physically tired and they're able to sleep at night. The other thing you need to consider uh, is, um, is the person acutely ill or is there something going wrong where they may have uh, what, what I call a delirium? Um, so an acute change in their mental status. And if someone has always been sleeping well and now all of a sudden they're not, you've tried all those non-farm approaches and it's not working and they're groggy during the day and they're up at night, you want to consider whether or not that there's something medically going on with them. Or oftentimes what happens is there's too much sedating daytime medicine and then they're not sleeping at night. So sometimes doing the pre, uh, deep prescribing activities can be helpful in that case. Then lastly, um, we try to stay away from sleeping medications um, because uh, the over-the-counter things tend to have that anticholinergic property in them. They often have Benadryl, diphenhydramine in them and can cause more confusion for people with dementia. Um, but there, are, and we also try to stay away from the uh, Z drugs and the benzodiazepines. Um, there are some uh, medications that tend to be antidepressants at low doses. Uh, that you that can be prescribed off-label to help with sleep, but you'd want to do all of those other things first before instituting, um, you know, a, a medication solution. That was a great answer. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I'm I get a lot. I get a lot of calls about sleep. <laughs> I'm gonna take some of those tips for myself. Um, and so, does anyone else have other questions? If not, I have a quick one. Uh, let's see. No. So um, what advice would you have for directors of nursing or folks at home care agencies that are doing private duty and have large um, CNA and caregiver workforces that when, when they are entering, t entering the homes of older adults living with dementia, when those older adults are um, terrified or when those families are against them wearing PPE? Like what kind of communication messages can um, be shared with caregivers and with the nursing leaders to be able to manage family negative reactions to PPE? Sure. So 
the, the way, and, and I had some of that at first. So in the height of the pandemic, when things were, were challenging, there was about a two month period of time where I was doing exclusively telehealth and phone check-ins. After that, um, people were starting to have negative outcomes and it became apparent that in some capacity, I needed to have some eyes on them. Uh, and I worked with, um, it, it was a little less with the families. The families actually were probably a little more comfortable having me come in um, than I was comfortable going in, <laughs> but it was more in the facilities. And I, you know, I think they're really concerned about liability and they don't know what you're bringing in, et cetera. So, I, but you can use the same approach with families who may be concerned. So start with the telehealth. Um, and then when something comes up, when the telehealth issue is uh, not cutting it, say, you know what, how about I come, I'm going to wear a mask, I'm going to stand six feet away and try some of those window door visits, you know, with the calling first. So you're, you're kind of slowly eking towards, you know, kind of getting in and getting them used to seeing you in a mask, whether or not they wear one or not, you're still going to be six feet away. Um, and then ultimately what happens is there comes a point where they need you to come in. And at that point, they at least feel that they've, you've respected their concerns. And oftentimes then they're saying, no, I, 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 I get it. I, you, you need to come in. So you have to really take a long view on this. It's not something that you can kind of change their mind about it already, um, you know, right in the beginning. And just explaining, you know, again, you know, I'm doing this for your protection as well as my protection. And I know it looks scary, but these are the things that I'm going to do to try to have it be less frightening. I'm going to call you ahead of time. I'm going to come by the window. When I need to come into the house, though, I'm going to have to put these, you know, more things on and, and I'm going to have a big picture so that you can remember really what I look like underneath of all of this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's challenging, but, you know, if you go slowly, oftentimes you can, you can win these folks over. That is a wonderful answer. I like the big picture. That's a great idea. The big picture is huge. It's, yeah, and, and you know, it's, it's almost like wearing a sheet of paper in front of yourself. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I, and, and it, it has to be a happy picture. <laughs> <laughs> big smiles. Big, big smiles. Big smiles. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I, I am thrilled with the questions that people have asked and we're going to just do a little bit of a closing. Um, but before we do that, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing your insights and your wisdom and and doing it in such an easy to understand manner. So we've been really pleased to have you with us, Dr. Gaelic. Uh, well, I've, I've, been, I've been thrilled to, to be invited. And, um, you know, I, I think we all want the same thing. We want good, good care for our patients and mm -hmm. anything we can share with one another, a lot, um, the better. A lot of these ideas were things, as I mentioned before, the young gentleman who did the GoPro yeah. with, a, with a bicycle, like he came up with that and it told me about it. So I'm, I'm constantly learning from, from other people, so. That's wonderful. Um, okay, so for anyone who wants more information on the Emergency Preparedness Network, info at MD Emergency Prepares, <laughs> MD Emergency Prep Network.org. For more information on Minka, info at Minka.org. For more information on our consulting and education company at Learn Care Together, hello at learncaretogether.com. And I'd like to use my extra minute to just make a shout out to Nassim Weisberg, who is the invisible wizard behind the scenes that is enabling all of this technology to move smoothly. And thank you, Nassim. He's the one that put your poll out there. And as always, we are grateful to the Maryland Department of Health, particularly the Maryland Office of Preparedness and Response. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining our fifth webinar in the COVID-19 series of the Emergency Preparedness Network. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks.